Okay, so I'm officially recording and I'll hand things over to Lupe, Cindy, and Mary uh, to further introduce themselves and get us started. My name is Lupe Valtiero and as you see, I'm the Community Development Educator in Lake County. Hi, I'm Mary Fell and good morning and I am the Community Development Educator um, in LaPorte County. And I'm Cindy Barber. I'm the community development educator um, in the southwest part of the state in Davies County. And I did want to mention um, that Lupe shared this morning that we had over 80 registered. So even though we're seeing 33 participants down there, hopefully more will join us. And then this is also available in its recorded version. So some people that couldn't make it today um, probably registered so they could receive that and view it later. So especially for our panelists, I want to make sure they know we've got um, a lot more folks that will be viewing um, after this session. So. Welcome everyone and thank you for joining us. So what we're going to do today is we're gonna kind of talk about um, about three or four different um, challenges that governments face. So what kind of um, challenges do you face when you're seeking grant, different grant opportunities? Or what do you face when you're looking for partners, especially those nonprofit partners throughout your community? And what kind of um, thing do you face when you're trying to keep those partnerships? What goes well with a partnership? What can go not well with a partnership? And how do you build your team um, going forward? And then we're finally going to talk about best practices while preparing a grant application. So first we wanted to start off by discussing where to find grant opportunities. As some of you are aware, there are governmental grant opportunities listservs for the federal and the state governments. You can find the federal government grants at grants.gov, and those are the 26 different agencies at the federal um, government. While state agencies, you have to look at each state agency's website to find their grant opportunities. For example, the Department of Natural Resources, the Department of um, Indiana Arts Commission, and the Office of Community and Rural Affairs are just a few state agencies. So other blogs, listservs, and media um, can include GrantStation, the Chronicles of Philanthropy, and Phil the Philanthropy News Digest. The Grant Station and Chronicles of Philanthropy cost some money to register and they can give you resources such as grant applications, grant funding, but also talk about jobs. The Philanthropy News Digest is a single daily news source that comes to your email and you can select subject areas that you want to get resources about. They send um, requests for proposals, um, other research, um, data, and also jobs related to grant writing. Other places you can find grant opportunities include foundations and corporate directories and databases. There are many databases out there and I wanna highlight one um, right now. So Foundation Directory Online is a collaboration between Foundation Center and GuideStar, which is known as Candid right now. The Foundation Directory Online is a resource with over 100,000 grant funders that um, have profiles but also applications that are available for participants. This database usually costs money for the participants and it's usually between 30 and $40 a month. However, because of COVID, there are the funding networks um, out there in the state of Indiana that are giving this resource away if you um, go to their website for free until August 31st. And the, the following public libraries or universities that have the foundation directory online that you can go and look at are the Anderson Public, Public Library, the Indianapolis Public Library, Allen County Public Library, Monroe County Public Library, Valpo University, and the German Township St. Joseph Public Library. And you can go on each of their websites I know at least the German Township and the Valpo University and click on their database and they will give you a free login information about the foundation directory online. After August 31st, you can find those information by going to those um, libraries and they will give you free access um, to search. Um, for those in the Northwest um, Indiana District, um, Valpo University Library is normally open till 2 a.m. 
So if you need a nightcap or you're looking for grants that way, you can go to their library. So um, in the foundation directory online, you can search for grant funders. You can also search for those um, like you. So if you're a township, a school, a library, or city or town, you can search um, what kind of other um, uh, townships or those had received funding in the past. So you can see what they got the money for and how much. You can also look up different subject areas and geographical focus areas just to kind of um, condense your search. There are also um, other foundations cut, such as the Indiana Philanthropy Alliance that you can be a part of that will give databases for specifically Indiana. One other thing we wanted to talk about for where do you find grant opportunities are websites for, of grant makers. So you can look at um, specific grant makers that you know in your community or you know in Indiana or around the United States or the world and look at their annual reports to see where they have given funding in the past, what their subject area focus are. You can also look at the 990 databases. So those are the, the forms they have to provide to the IRS and kind of gives you a little information about the grant and also how much and the board of directors on the 990 databases. So that's just a little bit um, about where you can find grant opportunities and we'll start, Lupe, you'll start with um, nonprofits and partnering. Thank you, Mary. I just went through my presentation with the phone on mute. Um, good morning. We're going to just kind of run through real quick. There's a whole lot of slides in here, so you're going to feel as if you have information low overload opportunities, but uh, the slides that you're going to be seeing should have keywords highlighted. You're going to get, if you haven't yet received the um, slide presentation deck, you'll get a copy of it and you'll get this information that you can read through at your leisure later on when you're looking for something to uh, fall asleep with. But as not-for-profits and local government units start to uh, consider whether or not they want to collaborate, there's a series of factors that they, under, that they work through. Um, and there you see them here on the graphic and we're gonna kind of go through these. This is the academic portion, if you will. This is what, what uh, justifies us doing this presentation in terms of there's research out there that says, these are the sorts of factors that you want to be looking for or consider as you're looking through. And we will again get more in depth on these. One of the factors that uh, people have to consider as, as they're looking to collaborate is questions of trust and uh, negative mutual perceptions. Oftentimes as we're looking at nonprofits, um, they have a tendency to work with age with, uh, nonprofits will work with public agencies to address social problems, to uh, also look at um, the the question of um, trust within the community. And the organization, there's a perception as to the organization's quality when a governmental unit wants to partner with them. Are they a reliable organization? Are they known within the community? Are they trusted within the community? And so local government units look at these types of issues. Who's doing what within the community and how good are they at what they're doing and what does a uh, community think of their process? A factor that both sides have to consider as well is the factor of resources. Local governments and nonprofits oftentimes they look for collaborations because there's a shortfall, there's a financial shortfall, and they're trying to remedy that. Or there's a, uh, a personnel shortfall. They don't have the, the staff sufficient to cover the different areas, and so they look to each other to provide some of those resources. Sometimes with local governments, while their business is to govern and to serve, there may be a lack of expertise in certain areas. And oftentimes with nonprofits, we will hear there's a lack of funding. If we had more money, we could. Um, and so there's opportunities there in terms of looking at shared resources. There is one theory that goes through the resource dependency theory that basically says organizations and governments, basically organizations will collaborate, especially when there are times of resource scarcity and there's a need to survive. And so when people are not getting, when organizations are not getting sufficient resources, they look for other sources, they look for other partners along the way, and that's that dependency theory. And again, they'll just enjoy the little graphic at the bottom there. 
there are times that organizations will look to interact and to collaborate to, to achieve legitimacy. They're a, a growing organization, for example, that's not well known and they want to make a, a greater name, a stronger name in their community. So they will find others to partner with. And so that sense of legitimacy is very important there. And that's oftentimes why institutionally um, organizations will decide to partner together because they will make each other stronger. The study that we looked at figures that once an organization and a nonprofit have, have accomplished their goals, then there's, there tends to be a willingness to collaborate more. Nothing breeds success like success. And that's one of probably the stronger point in this particular issue. Of course, the study had a very broad definition of what collaboration is, and I'm not going to bore you by reading this all through you, but it's the basic idea of working together towards a common end. Now, it was interesting to kind of take a look at this study to see, you know, how did they make these determinations as to what factors were important? So the study looked at the perception of interactions and they asked whether interactions with other sectors would increase, decrease, or stay the same. What's your, do you think they're gonna go up, they're gonna go down, or are you gonna see fewer of them? 48 of the respondents in the studies figured that they would uh, increase the, over the next three years. And interestingly, 48% said that, no, they'll probably stay about the same. We're not gonna see any more collaborations. We're gonna see about the same number right now. And good, bad, or otherwise, 4% said it's probably gonna decrease over the next three years. When they were asked to talk about what areas of service are, are you seeing these collaborations in or are the collaborations provided? These top three, education, social services, and economic development tended to be the areas of collaboration that were cited most by the surveyors. When asked about specific duties or services and the resources that were shared, uh, respondents again had the opportunity to select from a series of options that were presented there and the most often shared resources tended to be information exchanges, opportunities for grant funding or the actual funds that would come through, and the opportunities to develop public and private partnerships along the way. The survey asked about the effectiveness, the sense of effectiveness of past collaborations. And again, this is very positive. 53% uh, said that collaborations in the past either were effective or very effective. 29% said that they were fairly or somewhat effective. And only 9% felt that they were either ineffective or very ineffective. And 5% that somewhat effective, ineffective. And so you've got close to you know, over 80% of the past collaborations were deemed to be successful and effective. This is just a little quote that was pulled there. And I think oftentimes, you know, it's not for profits and local government units re review what happened and assess their, uh, their success in the process. They oftentimes they'll feel that, you know, once people get to the table, everyone receives something from the partnership and they're more willing to, to work with it and under, because they understand the process better and they understand the role that they play and they understand the benefits that they're gonna receive from these partnerships and collaborations. Surveyors were asked, well, what sort of accomplishments did these collaborations achieve for you? And they indicated there was increases in access and the quality of community services through the collaborations. There was an increase in citizen engagement and bringing the population more involved with uh, local government units. And there was an increase in trust levels between the governments and the nonprofit organizations. The one thing though that you would hope would happen that more resources would be developed through this process, that wasn't necessarily a result that was accomplished. Finances or resources are oftentimes a finite character. Surveyors were asked to talk a little bit about, well, what factors do you see that may limit collaborations along the way? A uh, quarter of the respondents agreed or strongly agreed that the competition for resources was probably one of the, one of the greater limiting factors that come along. Everyone's going after the same dollar. And 27% agreed that the lack of resources within their own organization or their own capacity internally was what would inhibit a collaboration. I'd love to help you with that, but I can't because I don't have the 
personnel. I don't have the resources. I don't have the facility. I don't have. Good news though, only 12% felt that operational differences between organizations and the local units would be a limiting factor. And the study did indicate that uh, logistics, such as working uh, office hours or locations, didn't necessarily have an impact. And we're seeing a lot of that through our, our current situation with the pandemic. People are able to communicate across the way, and so location's not as critical a factor anymore. You can start waking up now because we're about at the end of the, this portion. The study concluded a whole bunch of good stuff that there's lots of good things that can happen when local government units and not-for-profit organizations partner together. More importantly, the study was exploratory, but it really does illustrate the value of trust that comes across. And we're, hope, we're, we're pretty sure that the panelists we're gonna have coming up next are gonna touch on the issue of trust among governmental units and local entities. Um, they're also going to talk about, we, we believe, the organizational capacity, the importance of that factor as we go through. And that was your educational portion. Now we're here for the informative portion. Cindy. Okay. Um, so welcome again, everyone. Um, one of the things that um, we um, are grateful for with Purdue Extension, and I'm sure you feel the same, is um, the partnerships that we have with um, officials and, um, and wonderful community partners across the state. So we are all geographically spread out, your presenters today, as are our panelists. So we were so grateful we reached out to the three folks that were able to join us today um, for the expertise that they bring and their point of view sector. So um, I'm going to, you can see on the slide who we have with us um, serving on a panel, which a panel is a little bit challenging via Zoom. Um, but what we've worked out with the panelists is I'm going to introduce them um, one at a time. They're going to share some information with you from their perspective and then be jotting down any thoughts or, or questions that you have, or you can go ahead and start popping those into the chat box if you'd like. Um, Tamara, and Mary are gonna um, monitor that for us. And then when they finish um, sharing their information, um, we'll go ahead and open it up to questions. So um, feel free to begin uh, formulating those as, as they're uh, presenting their information. So as you can see from the slide that you have in front of you, our first uh, panelist is Sarah Nemitz, and she is a grant specialist um, with the Indiana Department of Natural Resources, Lake Michigan Coastal Program. Um, they're a federal pass-through program that receives funding through the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration with the mission of protecting and enhancing natural, cultural, and historical cultural resources and to foster coordination and partnerships among local, state, and federal agencies and local organizations. So Sarah, if you'd like to start us off, that would be great. Hi, everybody. Can everybody hear me okay? You're still a little bit low in your volume. I don't know if you can increase that, um, but yeah, thank you so much. No problem. So um, I just wanted to talk a little bit about, of course, please just ask any questions if you have them. Just a couple ideas about collaboration, specifically from our perspective as a federal pass-through program. Um, a lot of times, um, you're held as a grantee to the requirements of both the state and the federal side of things when you apply for pass-through funding. Um, so for us, um, the coastal program, our funds come from NOAA, which is federal, the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, and we pass them through our coastal program in, in, um, within the DNR. So we serve Lake Porter and LaPorte counties right along that 45 miles of shoreline. Um, we collaborate with a lot of nonprofits as well as state, municipal, federal government entities. And it's been really important and we've had a lot of issues where our federal funding is not allowed to be matched with other federal funding. And I feel like that's an issue that um, a lot of partnerships find to be hindering. So, um, if you have a really collaborative group of people ready to work on a project and some of those partners might end up being federal, their time doesn't always go um, toward match for our funding. So that can be um, a little bit of a stumbling block when you're looking to put your group of collaborators together. 
Um, another thing that sometimes can happen is um, some federal funding for certain kinds of projects can't be given directly to a nonprofit organization. So our funds specifically, we can, we can have a grantee that's a nonprofit organization, but not for certain types of projects. So if you're doing a land acquisition, for example, um, or a construction project for us, um, nonprofit organizations are not eligible to receive that funding. And that's a really good opportunity for some further collaboration. Um, an example of that would be, um, we had a project where a nonprofit in Lake County needed to do some renovations on their building. And that nonprofit served their community in a lot of different ways. It was a hub in the town. It was a rundown building, but people were there for all kinds of reasons. And the city's redevelopment commission thought it was worthwhile enough of a project and it benefited the community enough that the, non, the nonprofit was able to partner with the redevelopment commission. And the redevelopment commission was able to apply for the funding. We would reimburse them or provide the grant to the redevelopment commission and the, the central functional building space was able to be renovated. So it's really helpful and important when you are looking to put together your group of partners and stakeholders and collaborators to consider what everybody's bringing to the table and what everybody is benefiting from. So that's something that we really emphasize a lot, um, just realizing the restrictions within the funding you're applying for and finding ways to use your partners to work around it. I don't know if there's any follow-up questions on that. I don't want to keep just talking. <laughs> I think you're fine. That was wonderful. Um, I think we'll hold the questions till all the fi all the finalists, all the panelists have, have had a chance to present. And so we'll put a hold on that. And thank you so much. And I will say, um, um, Tamara mentioned at the beginning, but if you're, um, uh, if you're a participant in this webinar and you want to see the person speaking, you can hover over the top upper right hand corner of your screen and click on speaker view and that gives you um, a better way to see who's presenting and, and, and see them directly. So feel free to do that. Um, and next we have Kelly Streeter um, with us and Kelly um, wears several hats um, down in the southwest part of the state. Um, Kelly is the president of the Knox County Board of Commissioners. And she also fills two roles in neighboring Davies County, um, and, and those are government related as well. She's the Assistant Director of uh, Emergency Management, and she's also the Emergency Ma uh, Preparedness Coordinator for Public Health. Um, she's, she wanted me to make sure I share that both of the Davies County positions are grant funded to uh, Indiana Departments of Home, Homeland Security and Health. The federal pass-through grants are to foster community preparedness among all partners, public and private. So um, another opportunity for you to hear a little bit more about pass-through and, and that type of funding. So Kelly, if you could present next, that would be wonderful. Good morning. Um, I appreciate being a part of this panel. Um, but starting off as an elected official in Knox County uh, three and a half years ago, I found it really um, disheartening, so to say, that in such a rural community, we really weren't tapping into our grant opportunities. So um, where do we even begin in rural Indiana with a, a county that hadn't applied for large grants before? So the first thing was to collaborate with those that do and reaching out to the city of Vincennes, which is our largest population base right out of the gate, um, set a standard of continued um, grant opportunities. And I want to say, Lupe, the, uh, the study that you presented to us as an elected official uh, in local government is pretty spot on. I can attest that most all of those factors are something that I deal with or see my partners in elected office dealing with on a regular basis. Um, we saw a few years back um, many not-for-profits coming to Knox County asking for assistance with their plans and their programs and how do we even begin to set standards for giving funds because are they new or are they old is their mission worthy we're dealing with taxpayer dollars and um, whether we want to admit it or not there's many political factors tied to that so the first thing we did was put together um, a guideline uh, in a resolution form 
of entities that wanted to come to Knox County and, and request for funding to benefit their not-for-profit. Um, setting that standard right out of the gate of, of how they ask and how it has to fit in their request has proven um, a fair and standard way for us. I'm not only um, the president of the commissioners, I'm also the president of the Knox County Redevelopment Commission. And as an RDC member, we want to give back in every way we can to bolster our economy and other quality of life initiatives. So that standard, those guidelines have helped us greatly. Um, I'm, I may be way behind some of you guys already doing that, but I did want to share that. Um, saying that, it's, it's definitely no doubt in our community the lack of personnel. Um, we all wear many hats. As you see, I'm a government employee in another county. And really finding those individuals and, and getting the mission done um, without burnout is, is very difficult. For instance, you know, I as the executive have applied for grants myself. We, without a doubt, I, I say you reach out if, to your regional planning organization. If you do have one, we're lucky to have that. Um, but there are so many grants right now. Um, I'm going to shift into the pandemic recovery. Uh, we're all sitting here from different backgrounds, and myself as the executive, we have CARES money. My fellow um, people in public safety have criminal justice money. The courts are offered a whole host of money. We have FEMA money. And as you mentioned, Sarah, double dipping is a really big concern. So how do we manage who's applying for what? How do we manage um, what matches where? And this is a big task that we all really need to sit down and think about for pandemic recovery. So uh, what I'm doing is in Knox County and starting in Davies County is we're forming a coalition of partners um, that include uh, not-for-profits, that include our industrial partners, our small businesses, as well as our chamber and even our tourism, just to make sure that we're getting the biggest bang for our buck in pandemic recovery, because there are a great amount of double dipping issues, as I mentioned. Um, it's gonna be difficult, especially when you've got elected officials and public safety and many other people at the table. Um, but I think I, I think I just, I believe that forming that coalition and getting around, around the table is key. Um, I was just looking at my notes here. Um, ultimately, the uh, the coordination of the resources is most definitely difficult. And I think um, in our counties, most of us will rise to the occasion and, and still be in leadership roles as we normally are. But, you know, there are a lot of people that want to help. And um, we've we've went to live streaming of our government agency meetings and several other factors and it's surprising how many people have wanted to step up in agencies that normally wouldn't so i am um, i appreciate the time and welcome to answer any questions but on my public safety role um we we are grant funded most of emergency management and uh, the health preparedness position is grant funded through federal sources uh, counties are very lucky in Indiana, all 92, to be applicable for this money. I urge you all to, to better understand what that means for your entities, because not only does it benefit local government, but we provide support to our schools, uh, even Purdue Extension in many ways. Right now, I'm in a role where we're helping, um, through my grant-funded position, prepare and plan for our 4-H fairs uh, and making sure it's safe. So your EMA and your, your emergency preparedness person in the health department are, are great grant funded positions to help with continuity planning of all applications, including business. So be welcome to answer any questions. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Kelly, that was wonderful. Um, we'll hold off on questions and I do think we're getting a few things in the chat box, but we'll go ahead and um, have Melinda present and then we'll open it up for questions. Thank you. Thank okay. you. Good morning, everyone. Um, oh. I'm Melinda Waldrop. I'm the Director of Programs and Strategic Engagement for the Community Foundation Alliance. We are a um, alliance of nine community foundations in Southwest Indiana with our central corporate office located in Evansville. Uh, we work with donors to create endowment funds that produce grant monies to support nonprofits and also to 
uh, support scholarships for area students. Um, the Community Foundation also has a pool of unrestricted grant monies that we can utilize to make grants to um, local nonprofits and governmental agencies um, based on an application process. Um, governmental agencies can apply for these grant dollars uh, for charitable projects um, that serve the communities that they are in. And we do um, consider a broad range of program project types. Um, most commonly, we see among governmental agencies um, applications for beautification projects, community recreation projects through parks departments, um, also education programs. Um, that might center around diversity or environmental issues, traditional um, educational programs within our schools and preschools, um, and even higher education. Um, we also will fund um, community development projects that, um, for instance, um, impact the homelessness problem uh, that seek to create stronger neighborhoods and projects that support community centers. Um, the Community Foundation wants to work with our governmental agencies. We value your expertise in knowing your communities and knowing your citizens. Um, we also rely on the studies that you conduct that uncover the various community needs that are out there and the development of the plans to address those needs. Uh, we try to make it a priority to meet with our local and state government officials so that we can hone in on those common interests that allow us all to help make our communities thrive. And so with that, it's very important that, um, you know, our government officials are accessible. Um, we sometimes do have um, accessibility problems connecting with those who are decision makers. Um, we know our government officials are extremely busy and there are lots of connections they are making. We typically don't have problems connecting with um, departmental leaders, which is wonderful. Um, but I would say, you know, as, as much as possible, those decision makers can be accessible, um, it's very much appreciated, appreciated and uh, valuable for, for our work as well. Um, this is the time we're really just looking to discuss their viewpoints um, on the issues and looking for ways that we can work together. Uh, we value a free exchange of ideas and the community uh, forums that we've held throughout our nine county region um, I think shows that we really want to hear from the community. We want to hear from our community leaders. We want to hear from our business nonprofit leaders and um, also our government officials. We want to know what's happening on the ground so that we can work with you on projects um, to help convene or in some cases uh, when we have the monies to uh, grant for those types of projects, we are interested in considering those and looking into that as well. Um, as far as collaborating with nonprofit um, partners, uh, I would just suggest that um, for government officials to really get to know the organizations and the leaders that are sitting around the table. I think that's very important to know what their roles are. Um, in the community and um, especially in considering the particular subject matter that um, is being um, discussed and being open to what those leaders, those nonprofit leaders, community foundation leaders, what their contributions can be uh, to impact the issue at hand. Um, for applying for grants from us, we for government official or government agencies, we really uh, want to make sure that 
if your department is applying for a grant that um, all the agency players know about the grant and that they also know if there are any restrictions. Um, you know, if it's charitable, we can fund it, but um, if it involves any kind of um, uh, legislating, you know, there we do obviously have some limitations, but um, but it's important that anyone who would be part of the project does know about the grant application and the ultimate grant because there can be some hindrances that take place if if everyone's not um, in the loop and on the same page. Um, when writing a grant application, you know, writing a strong application is essential. Um, and a strong application is um, one, submitting it on time, of course, um, but um, being clear and concise um, about your project that you're proposing, um, trying to stay away from any jargon that may not be easily understood um, by um, an average person, um, answering all questions as they're asked um, and making sure that those answers are complete and clear. Um, and also, if you have any questions about the application or can we fund a project, reach out to your community foundation representative. We have program staff in all of our counties throughout the nine county region, and they are willing and very happy to um, assist with any questions about the grant making process. Um, and bottom line on the, applying for grants with us or really with any entity is that um, when your grant application is better written, it is usually a stronger proposal. Um, and so uh, looking towards um, programs or education opportunities to help you understand how to write those grant proposals um, is very beneficial for you. So um, that's all the comments that I had this time. Okay, Melinda, thank you so much. I do want to, before we go to, to, um, to questions from the participants, I do want to add um, two, two thoughts when you were speaking. I know um, our community foundation director here in Davies County prides herself like we do that there's community foundations in all 92 counties. Is that correct? Like, like we're, we're, we're in every, we're in all 92 counties. So when you were referencing the Alliance, which is wonderful, and that's a geographic area in Southwest Indiana, the information will be generally uh, pertain to all counties, correct? Correct, yes, there are community foundations in all counties in Indiana, yes. Wonderful, and then Melinda knows from uh, personal experience, and I'm sure we'll talk about it at the end of the of the presentation in general, but um, we do offer in, in times where we can meet face to face a two day workshop um, that a lot of folks have taken advantage of and we will continue to offer that and um, and things may look a little bit different with social distancing and that kind of thing. But as of July one we will be face to face again. So hopefully we'll be seeing more of those two full day workshop opportunities for um, honing those skills and acquiring new skills to write write really excellent proposals. Um, so that was a wonderful overview from from several from three different perspectives that we um, are so grateful for. Um, I love how how you each spoke to what we wanted out of this presentation and that is that we want to make sure we provide to our local government units the support assistance and encouragement they need to always go after funding opportunities um, that are available that they may not realize are out there or that they just haven't taken advantage of prior um, but also that especially given the, the recovery from the pandemic that we're um, capitalizing and, and making sure that everyone has what they need. Um, I will say as you were um, presenting, Melinda, I did notice that um, Tamara shared in the chat if, if you weren't able to see that as participants, um, uh, a really nice document that speaks, I think, somewhat to what Kelly was talking about, about those collaborations around recovery from the pandemic, and that is a community recovery workbook. It gives you a step-by-step -step way to look at how to gather those coalitions to look at needs and find ways to address those needs. 
And I'm going to let Tamara speak a little bit more to that if she needs to, because she shared that document. And yeah, so this is from a statewide coalition with many of the member organizations that you belong uh, to. And so I just wanted to put that out there as Kelly was talking about um, kind of organizing those broad community coalitions around recovery. Uh, this might be a document that you can make and, and take and uh, make your own and use uh, to help with those efforts. And we're also out there, all the local government, state local government um, associations, um, as well as the IEDA and the Community Foundation or the IPA um, are out there to help uh, walk people through that if they need, need that help. Um, I also am going to add, because Kelly was talking about the CARES Act and there was a new FAQ or the FAQ was updated yesterday, so I'm adding that link from the Treasury as well. Wonderful. And I, on, on what Melinda shared, another couple of other thoughts that came to mind. Uh, honestly, Purdue Extension is often listed as a partner on grant proposals. And I will say from personal experience, um, to speak to what Melinda talked about, sometimes um, I think uh, folks preparing those grants kind of brainstorm the list of partners they think would be a great potential, but they don't necessarily connect with the partner <laughs> to inform them that they're being um, added to the proposal. So um, I think that's another key too, is um, that communication piece. I appreciated that Melinda said, reach out to your community foundation offices. Our staff are also available. We've got folks in almost all of our offices that could assist or review a document and kind of help you out if you need that. But, um, but really making sure you've communicated um, we don't require like an MOU if you're going to put us on a grant proposal, but we do want to know that you have us on there so we can, number one, know, know what the partnership is going to entail, but we might have additional resources you're not even aware of because of the vastness of the expertise in our offices. So be sure to, that communication piece to me is key. And part of that is making sure you've written your proposal ahead of time enough to be able to share that. So maybe not waiting for the last minute on, on finalizing the proposal. Um, do we have any other questions in the chat? I was trying to keep up with it and it- uh, I don't see any in the chat. Any. Um, I have one that um, privately and they just asked, Kelly, you mentioned some different um, grant opportunities. Uh, and if you wouldn't mind adding links to those, that would be great. If you don't have those readily available, that's fine too. Um, for what specifically? Any specific? Um, My guess, Kelly, would be that they were the ones, as you were talking about, the CARES funding that's come across to the Department of Justice, to the different agencies within the local government yes. units that we may not be aware of. Well, that's where the, the lack of communication comes in play. Um, I know the Association of Indiana Counties has provided a thorough list on their website. Um, our corresponding uh, associations do have that, but I, it has come to me as the executive through multiple departments in my own county. So I'm just repeating um, what has come to me through questions, should we or should we not apply for this? And we have to sit down and look at, you know, the judges when they receive their Supreme Court and or CJI documents. So I can't give that list, um, but I do know our associations do have a thorough document, especially AIC. I recommend going there. Um, if I could make one comment um, as an elected official, and I do admit readily that it is very difficult to make sure all contacts are made that, that are necessary when grant applications are made. Um, I'm not making excuses in the fact of we are busy and not having an administrator myself um, or any sort of even a human resources person to deal with day-to-day -day functions, um, it is difficult. So what I recommend um, for my seat is in collaborative efforts, we as elected officials do like to see our community partners, including the foundation and our chambers to come to our business meetings as well. I think um, a quarterly basis, um, even biannual, just to say, hey, here's what we're doing, here's where we wanna partner and um, continue building of that relationship two-way is key. So, thank you. Excellent point, Kelly. Thanks for sharing that. Um, I do know from peeking at our participant list that we do have um, at least one member of a, a local plan commission. And so I would, I would put out there in our last couple of minutes before we um, 
conclude the presentation and speak a little bit to best practices that if anyone on the call has anything they would like to share, so we don't assume that you come just with questions, but you come with an expertise that might be beneficial to your co-participants. Co if you have anything you'd like to share about opportunities that you know of or, or, or just words of wisdom or advice, please feel free to speak up and take yourself off mute and share those thoughts with the group. I mean that we want to be collaborative in, in what we're learning today. So if you you'd like to say that isn't a question, but a statement about grants or seeking funding to support the communities, please feel free to unmute yourself and share that as well. Um, I had one more thing I just wanted to add really quickly. It's Sarah here, guys. Um, I just really want to encourage everybody. I, I know that every um, individual municipality and organization, they're having their own struggles um, regarding, you know, coming across funding opportunities and whether or not they're necessarily eligible to receive them. Really focus on the need and sort of putting that into words. So, you know, identifying the need or the gap that you are experiencing or your organization is experiencing will really help you find the right funding source. I think it's really helpful and important. So I, I think that right now, um, in terms of pandemic recovery, it may be just general community support. And, and don't hesitate to go, don't hesitate to go to your state offices, go to the Department of Homeland Security, you know, find a guy, call a guy. I mean, we're here to help, we're public servants. So don't, don't, you know, get on the phone and just make connections. I, I mean, I, our, our specific funding source through DNR is very specific, but if we can't help you, we know what else is going on within DNR and we can get you on the phone with them. So I think what's really important is number one, just identifying what exactly it is that you need. What resource are you lacking? Where is your capacity low? Um, where are your partners? You know, once you've all talked, like what needs are still not being met? And then just say it and then keep saying it. And, and I can't believe how resourceful working for state government we've been able to be. So sometimes it'll be, give me 48 hours and I'll get back to you. But really just, just state your need and, and keep, keep saying it. Go to your planning commission, you know, make those partnerships, talk to people in state government, call your people because there are, there are, there are seeds that you need to be planting so that as we're talking to other people, we can come back and say, oh, there's that need, here we go. Because in general, we all just wanna help. So if you can't find your funding source, there is somebody else who can, and, and we're always willing to help. So I think that's what's most important, knowing your need and, and just saying it. So I, I don't know if that's helpful, but like if it's random and you call me, I will help. <laughs> and I think that's the case for everybody, so. I hope that helped. <laughs> Sarah, that's the perfect wrap up to the panel discussion. I, I can, couldn't have said it better. Thank you so much and I agree. And I think we all would say that, just reach out to those in your community that are also wanting to serve and we will help you get connected. We all um, are very grateful to be able to do that. So with that said, I'm gonna turn it back to my colleagues to wrap us up. And again, if you think of questions, drop them in the chat. Um, and thank you so much to our panelists. Um, it was really nice to work across um, the entire state and looking at how to set up this webinar. Um, and I just couldn't be more pleased with the outcome um, and especially in the folks that we joined us from partners across the state to share information from their perspective as well. So thank you very much. So thanks, Cindy, and thanks the panel. And so now we're gonna kind of talk about best practices when writing a grant proposal and grant writing in general. So some best practices that you need to think about are find reliable sources, something that Sarah was talking about, those community needs, those assessments, demographic data, um, et cetera. For example, maybe you're going to use the census data, the youth institute data, or county health rankings to actually develop your need for the facts. Keep in mind what funders look for when they're reviewing your proposal. Um, most of the time, this should be in your RFP, which is the request for proposal. It can be a proposal, a request for applicants, but make sure you read those requests for proposals and answer those questions thoroughly and easy to, um, to read. 
focus the proposal language on the specific RFP or funder ca um, categories. Don't be generic. Don't copy and paste what you um, wrote for maybe the federal government. You're just going to copy and paste what you were going to write to the county or the community foundation. Each of them have a set um, request for a proposal, and most of the time there are some different questions. However, usually on proposals, there's some main key components, such as your budget, your project narrative, um, your facts. Sometimes there's a timeline, and most time they want to know what your outcomes are going to be. You need to understand fiscal responsibility and accountability of collaborators or collaboration. Budgets are always always one of the key sections in your grant proposal. This tells if you can actually do what you say you're going to do. Take time to polish the proposal language and format. Do not wait till the last minute um, to get others to review your proposal. And I recommend that you get people outside of your organization to read your proposals. And what kind of what Melinda said is avoid those jargons or acronyms that we all know and love. So in a survey of community foundation funders that we had conducted, there are some, these are some of the top results of what reviewers say make a strong proposal. The first one is following the directions. If they say you only have 400 words or characters, don't go over. Um, make it easy for the reader to um, look at your proposal. The clarity of the proposal, which I've kind of already talked about, the feasibility plan of operation, can everything happen that you are going to do, say you're going to do? Um, sometimes this, after you get the um, grant, you can look at this um, plan to see if you can actually accomplish, and hopefully you can. You need to have a broad impact of the program. A lot of funders um, say if you can get more, it, let's say there's a grant proposal going in for 10 people, but another one going with 100 or 1,000. More of the broad impact would be, I would, as a funder, would um, select the one that could get 1,000 people. So kind of look at the broad impact, maybe impact economically, socially, environmentally, uh, changing conditions that you're going to do in your project or program. You address a need. And you clearly state the source. Wikipedia is not a source to be used in, um, in addressing a need. It could be census. It could be, um, as I said, um, other county health rankings. And local data is best if you can get that data. So writing for a specific goal, please read through all the guidelines. There'll be some changes and maybe some page numbers you need to incorporate, but make sure to read, read, read those guidelines. Allow adequate time. So I know a lot of federal grants can be a two week turnaround, but also know that if you don't have time, it's okay to let the grant go. Um, you need to work backwards from the due date. So for example, I need to submit it by um, July 1st. Well, if it's June 25th right now, maybe I, I might say I don't have enough time, but if it's um, your proposal is due September 1st, I work back and try to get um, sections done, but also talk to those um, players that are going to be key in your implementation. So those that maybe it's the treasurer's office or the accounting firm or auditor's office that you need to talk to to make sure this is this can actually happen. And sometimes you frankly have to talk to your county attorney or to make sure you're not double dipping as some of the panelists said. Um, you need to request additional guidance if needed and the panelists really talked about this and they're just a phone call away. So if you have a questions, please feel free to reach out to them. They are not scary people, they, they wanna give money. So they just wanna help you um, be the best proposal. And as I said, contact the funder if appropriate, if you have more questions. It's better to ask questions than not ask. And down the line, you, that, the question that you wanted to ask was the, the reason why you didn't get the grant. So polishing your proposal before submitting. So as I said before, reread the guidelines and go through each guideline step by step. Make sure that if there's a page requirement, if it's 10 pages, don't go over the 10 pages. Make sure there's a word count. 
specifically make sure the attachments are ha as what they want you to do in the RFP. So if they wanted um, to attach them as PDFs, you need to um, attach the files as a PDF instead of a Word document. Check for repeated words or phrases. So there are thesauruses that you can use um, to help you with that. Um, make sure you don't repeat words um, often. Um, so, but if you're saying about your organizations, it's okay in that section. Avoid jargon and acronyms. Um, you guys might understand what that acronym might be, but a, a lay person or someone outside of your organization may not know what that acronym is. So make sure to at least spell it out the first time and put it in parentheses. Spell check is your best friend. So, and have people who are English um, or those who like to get that red pen out to um, proofread your document. Please verify budget numbers um, that they add up and that you have, if it requests for a match, that you include that match in there. You can also use some in-kind donations. So for example, in-kind can be um, pro bono work from maybe attorney. It could be computer access. It can also be volunteer hours. And the independentsector.org gives the amount per volunteer hour that you can incorporate into a grant proposal, and they have it for each state. So for Indiana, it's between $23 and $24 an hour for volunteer hours. And another um, best practice is keep an exact copy in Word. So that will help you, one, with spell check, one, with making sure it saves, because I've been in uh, processes where um, I go and try to submit a grant at one time, uh, my internet kicks out and I lose all of what I have written. So if you have it in a Word document, you'll be able to at least get back most of that um, information and save it. Please send those Word documents to um, your people who are going to actually do the program or project so they know exactly what they're expected to do and make sure you have a conversation with them to talk about um, those what to do. So that's a really fast thing on the best practices and so Cindy kind of talked about this. Um, we do host a two-day workshop of grant writing and we go through the process of actually preparing a uh, grant proposal through the process of the project narrative budget um, evaluation and timeline. And then we also have a grant panel to discuss local funding through that organization. We also bring, bring back on day two and they get to review proposals. The best thing about grant writing is actually reviewing proposals. You learn a lot and you can use some wording and you, you can learn about what reviewers look, like, look for. So that's our little 30 second commercial if you guys want to learn about grant writing um, and the beginning guide to grant writing just let us know. So do we have any questions or any other statements I know we're at 11 o'clock or 10 o'clock central time. I did notice that Mary, that Jamison Hibbs uh, mentioned in the, in the chat to not overlook parks and recs agencies when seeking potential grants. Many of those uh, veterans in those areas have researched and possibly applied and received a diverse segment of grants. So we thank Jamison for that. So if, um, if, when you're looking for uh, resources, um, don't forget those folks as well. Did someone ask about when is the next two day workshop? Stay tuned. Yeah, so, uh, you know, we're, we are still working from home, as you probably see in our backgrounds, and um, are able to start having face-to-face -face events with uh, July 1st, but with uh, many restrictions and considerations. So um, I don't know that any of those are on the books yet. We're still waiting to, to find out what's possible and what's not. Um, so I, if each of our presenters will just pop their email address into the chat for everyone. 
we'll wrap things up. Um, and I just want to thank you for being with us today. Uh, this it has been recorded and I will send it out along with um, some of the links from the chat um, as soon as it's converted and ready. So it'll probably be tomorrow um, before I get that sent out. Um, feel free to reach out to any of those panelists or our presenters. I know um, I, oft, I sit in the same office as uh, someone on the grant writing team. He's not with us today, but whenever I'm writing a grant, I have him review it and um, it's, it's really helpful. So I have no doubt that going through that two-day process or two-day workshop and um, having, uh, having your grant reviewed by participants and, and trainers is very helpful and has made me a better grant writer sitting in the same office as him. So I want to thank our presenters and panelists and have a wonderful day, everyone.